Okay, uh, was everyone able to get the labs? No? Okay, so, yeah. Yeah, so the windows will be fine for the first lab. Um, we can just build the, the flow graph that's part of the zip file. Um, we can just build it by hand. It's a few blocks, um, but that will be in the second half of the uh, tutorial. Um, so once you download the labs, um, open the terminal and uh, type this command, IAO info dash n, and then this IP address. Um, and you should get a response from the radio. If you can't find it, please raise your hand and uh, we'll check your virtual box. So uh, this tutorial will go through uh, the Pluto itself, the transceiver inside of it, as well as the software and HDL pieces that, are, uh, that drive Pluto and allow you to access and use the transceiver on board. Uh, my name is Travis Collins. I'm from Analog Devices. Um, I have with me uh, Mahai and uh, Adrian uh, from ADI as well. Um, I've come, come in all the way from California, which is kind of a bit of a flight. Um, and I'm still kind of jet lagged a bit. Uh, and if I kind of wander off with my voice, please tell me and I'll speak louder um, or go slower. Uh, and uh, please ask questions. Uh, this is kind of boring for me if uh, it's just some big monologue. Um, but uh, you know, feel free to ask questions if, if something isn't clear uh, or if you want to get more information. Um, now, just a little introduction on SDR devices. Um, so he, this is actually a picture of a radio that we used to bring around to a trade show itself, uh, where you have like five or six boards, Mixers, up and down uh, mixers, um, uh, PAs, LNAs, um, converters. Um, and what's not shown here, besides the you know, five power supplies that are driving it, are the five PCs that are underneath the table that are driving the solution. And you needed five PCs because none of the software worked. Um, you know, it worked on different OSs, on different versions of OSs. Um, and it's a big, complicated um, device. And using this, is um, a challenge not only for the people developing uh, these devices, but also those using it for applications. Um, and this is why we've built devices like the 9363, 9361 that are inside Pluto and other SDRs that you've used. Now, just a little uh, to talk a little bit about the architecture of the transceivers themselves. Um, if we kind of go back to the basics of radios, um, the most common radios for the past like 50, 60 years have been this uh, superhead style, super heterodyne style of radio, where you have uh, you know, a, so an R signal will come in and then go through a series of, uh, of um, IF stages, where you might have one or two stages. Um, and this design is big, powerful, or uh, power hungry, um, but uh, you know, this is the kind of traditional style of radios that um, if you're a little bit older than me, you're, you're, this is kind of the radios that you're used to in the past. Um, and on the um, super kind of bleeding edge of radio design is this direct RF style of uh, radio, where you have a very high speed converter, like a RF DAC or RF ADC, that's directly hooked up to an antenna. And this is kind of the newer style of devices, but it requires very wide uh, converters, like uh, 10 giga sample a second uh, deck converters. And dealing with that data is a challenge, and uh, feeding power to a device like this is, uh, is a challenge as well. And just like using it from a software and e HDL perspective uh, can be very difficult. Um, and we have this kind of third style of radio, which we call zero IF. Instead of having a IF stage, we directly mix down that RF signal to baseband, where the converters feed it in. And this is the um, the most common style of transceiver that uh, ADI provides. So the 9361, 71, and the newest generation transceivers all use this zero IF style where we have uh, a single mixer and that brings things down to baseband. And this really hasn't been possible 
um, uh, for, uh, I would say, you know, until the last like 10, 15 years, just because of there, there's added complexity when you have a single IAP stage. You have to deal with um, images and DC problems that are common to this architecture. And there's a lot of pieces inside the, the, the chips themselves that kind of compensate or deal with these non-idealities that are introduced from this architecture. So, you know, the, these are very simplified block, block diagrams uh, of radios, but really what makes them work is things like quad calibration, baseband filtering, DC correction, um, integrated LNAs, programmable baseband filters. So there's a lot of moving pieces inside the transceivers, which makes them super flexible, but also really complicated to use. And uh, over the past um, five, 10 years, we've tried to simplify that or make it easier for people to use these devices with uh, s different layers of software that abstract a lot of this complexity away and try to manage things in a more sustainable way. Uh, now, the, the transceivers from ADI, like inside Pluto, is a 9363, which is part of uh, this kind of family up top. So we have the 61, 63, 64. And the real differences between them are reduced bandwidth or reduced channel count that you might have. So Pluto is based on the 63, which has, is technically two by two. We uh, pin out only uh, one transmit, one receive channel, uh, but it has a reduced bandwidth um, of uh, 20 megahertz uh, that you can receive. The transceivers on the bottom are the second and third generation devices. So, so the 9371, uh, which is just like, these are just more bandwidth, um, uh, higher linearity performance. Um, 75 is unique because it has integrated digital pre-distortion, uh, which is a, the first chip ever to, to do that. Um, and you know, this is kind of a big complicated table of, this is really just talking about the differences between these devices. Um, this is not to, meant to be a sales pitch or anything like that, but uh, depending on your application, you'll use a different device. Um, for most people, they don't need 200, 400 megahertz of bandwidth, and a device like the 9361 or uh, the 63 that's in Pluto is uh, you know, enough for most of your applications. And as you go up in bandwidth, you go up in power and complexity. So uh, you know, it's, it's nice having the linearity performance of the, the newer transceivers, but there's added complexity associated with kind of dealing with that. Um, but if you're uh, kind of coming from the, I would say the more consumer end of SDRs, um, and you're not fully familiar with the chips that ADI provides. If you're using a device like a USRP um, or a, uh, on the right we have a, um, a Sidekick uh, from a company called Epic Solutions. Uh, there's a Blade RF uh, in the middle, uh, B-Cube, um, NewTek on the bottom right. All these devices contain uh, analog devices transceivers. So you, you probably used that before, uh, you just didn't, didn't know. But to drive these chips, there's a lot of kind of moving pieces that are involved. And at the end of the day, it's, you know, you'll have your, some hardware on the left, some HDL that will interface with that hardware, um, and then some software that's driving it, that's managing state, that's um, uh, handling the different settings of the device, allowing you to interface with it at different levels. And then there'll be some um, higher level software on top that allows you to stream data back and forth from the device. But software-defined radio is kind of this, um, uh, this mixture of many disciplines, which makes it uh, super powerful, but also complicated, because you have to be an expert in RF design, in software engineering, in SOC assembly, in you know, DSP. Uh, my background is in communications. Um, my master's and PhD are in uh, comms theory. Um, so that's kind of my end of the field. Um, but to do SDR right and to get the performance out of these devices, you really need to be um, you know, knowledgeable in all these spaces. And SDR is really in the center of them. So uh, most uh, development of radios is really a, a group effort. And uh, uh, it's hard to be an expert in all these fields. OK. So let's talk about uh, Pluto uh, specifically. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, Pluto is using a 9363 inside of it which is this uh, zero IF architecture, uh, which you have on the left. On the right is the simplified block diagram of the 9363, where we have uh, uh, trans uh, transmit channels on, or excuse me, receive uh, paths on the top right. On the bottom, we have uh, 
the, uh, the transit pass. And then on the far right, we have this kind of <laughs> uh, a collection of things we say other stuff, or it's like that, the things that make it work. Right? Most of us are just interested in the transceiver, but you need these other pieces to move data back and forth, to interface with the device, to uh, configure it, uh, to make it usable. And we'll be talking about that um, uh, throughout the presentation. So who is uh, familiar with a, a Zinc or a, a Zinc-based FPGA? Okay. Uh, so for those who aren't, um, a, a Zinc uh, is a, a more modern FPGA. Um, Zinc is from uh, Xilinx. Xilinx makes the Zinc-based radios. Um, the unique things about the Zinc series is that they include programmable logic as well as um, embedded processors. So they have hard ARM cores on, uh, on board them. Um, so Pluto has a Zinc 7010 on board, which is a, a pretty small FPGA. Uh, but we re really just use it to interface with the device to pull data back and forth. Um, there is some resources available if you want to do some signal processing. Um, there's uh, about 80 DSP slices available, um, and kind of you can use them uh, freely as you want. Um, and here's kind of the uh, basic marketing uh, diagram of what Pluto is, where you have transmit, receive, and USB. And that's you know, the, the simplest way we can put it. But there's a lot more going on to actually m make that work and move signals back and forth. On the right, we have the, the bore that's actually inside Pluto, where we have the zinc that's in the middle, uh, the transceiver on top, and then we have uh, USB Phi, um, some DDR, uh, and flash as well on board. And the device uh, is uh, 12 bits, both uh, DAC and ADCs. Um, is uh, flexible from 20 kilohertz uh, to 20 megahertz of Racine bandwidth. This is complex bandwidth, INQ. And then um, it's, uh, that's, you can stream that out over USB 2. So the device is, is uh, capable of uh, supporting the max rate of the transceiver, uh, but not over the USB connection. So, but uh, to be honest, like GNU radio cannot handle the full bandwidth of the transceiver. Um, so the, the channel bandwidth is 20 megahertz, but the actual data rate that you can get back, that you can run the converters at, is uh, 61.44 mega, uh, mega samples a second. Uh, and uh, yeah, so and then, then if you're say pinning out both transmit and receive and both uh, channels for transmit and receive, you actually cannot keep up with it with USB 3.0. So it's uh, uh, we say that uh, the USB 2 is fine for most people's applications. Uh, now one of the reasons we actually did Pluto was because um, people didn't believe that you could build a low-cost solution around uh, the transceiver and around kind of our products. ADI has been really traditionally known for super high-end um, devices, um, converters, uh, analog components. Um, but uh, you can, uh, Pluto is really a, represent, a representation of uh, a simplified design uh, that uh, you can build on your own. The, the bomb has only 72 line items, so that includes like, you know, all the way down to like resistors, capacitors. Um, um, it's a very, very, um, a uh, compact design. And uh, we provide, um, you know, uh, schematics, Gerbers, uh, Allegro files online. So if you want to build your own board off of Pluto, you're completely uh, uh, free to do that, and we, we really welcome uh, that. But if we look at the kind of system level pieces, um, Pluto is essentially a transceiver, FPGA, and the pieces needed to run that FPGA. And Linux runs on board. So you can SSH into the board, um, it has a, a UART console that comes up automatically. Um, and then there's obviously uh, DDR, SPY, uh, SPY flash, um, and then power <coughs> provided on the board just to get things going and to, to make the processor usable. But compared to, say, other devices that we've had in the past, um, on the left is a, a more traditional, I would say, eval system that ADI would provide, or even uh, some of our competitors would provide where you have a uh, FPGA eval system like a Z board or a ZC706 or like an ultra scale variant. Um, and then you have a FMC card that hooks up to that. And this is really what people would take into the lab, do development on. Um, and then we have on the right uh, more integrated solutions like Pluto. Um, we have also the uh, Epic Sidekick, which is uh, one of our partner boards. Um, and also these uh, Sysimon modules or SOMs 
that we also provide, and these are s designed to kind of build around them, so they don't include uh, front ends on them. Um, they're modules that you start from, and then you add the additional pieces for your own radio to really simplify the development process for you. Uh, but if you look at the kind of block diagrams, they're, they're pretty much identical. They all have a transceiver, FPGA, and some connectivity off the board to, uh, to allow you to control things from a remote computer or uh, some other base device. Now, Pluto is a, a little unique. Uh, when you plug it in, it will show up as four devices. Uh, one is uh, mass storage. The mass storage includes um, some basic information as well as uh, uh, like the info or some configuration that you can control. Um, so I have Pluto hooked up right now and get my mouse. If I go to my, uh, this PC, you see that I have a Pluto mass storage device right here. If I click on that, uh, there's a few files on board the device. There's a config file, and this will include um, information for setting up the network configuration. If you want to plug in USB dongles for Ethernet, Wi-Fi, you can configure those settings uh, from this configuration file. You can set up some additional diagnostics if you want to run that on Pluto if something isn't working as you expected. Um, and then we also have these, these web pages that uh, contain a lot of valuable information that will tell you what the, how to upgrade the firmware, where to get drivers from, where to get the software libraries to interface with the device, um, some basic getting started tips, IO info, um, which we'll be going into in the lab, and then different frameworks like MATLAB, GNU Radio, um, some other tools uh, that ADI provides. Um, and just basic information if uh, you know, you're just starting off and want to learn how to interface with Pluto. Uh, it's all available on board. Now, besides the mass storage device, it also shows up as a, um, a serial device. So you can access it over UART as well as uh, an Ethernet device, which uh, is a little weird um, because it's connected over USB. Um, if I go to... Um, Spending too much time on Linux, I'm forgetting all the commands. So Pluto will show up actually as an Ethernet device. Right here. And one of the reasons we did this is for virtual machines. Um, w whenever you set up a virtual machine, um, they're always going to have networking working. It's just the first thing you need to do, you know, app get install something. Uh, and USB can be a little bit on the flaky side uh, in general. So uh, network uh, is an obvious um, thing to have on the device. And this works through a tethering protocol called RNDIS. Uh, this is a, actually a Microsoft standard and is available in the Linux kernel as well. Um, and uh, uh, to get this to work on Mac OS X, uh, you requires a little package called Horrendous. A little play on uh, Horrendous. Um, and uh, that will allow you to get uh, uh, network connectivity if you're on a Mac, which is just a little kind of quirk because Apple is not going to implement uh, a standard from Windows uh, on their machines. Okay. Uh, are, are there any questions so far? Uh, yeah. Yes, yeah, so you can, you can drop uh, firmware files or even the, the entire zip file that contains like uh, the, some of the other like debug boot files we provide, like the JTAG boot files, the DFU files. You can simply drop that on Pluto, eject it, and it'll update. Do you think it'll boot from the sp serial flash then? Uh, the there's some sort of some state uh, embedded in the serial flash? Uh, yes. Uh, yes, yes. Yeah, so you, you can't boot from the mass storage device. Mm -hmm. uh, you, have to, um, you have to write to the flash on the device to do that. Yeah, right. Okay. Um, now, uh, one thing that's also unique about Pluto is that it's two, S two USB ports, and this is kind of confusing for a, a lot of people. Um, uh, Pluto has the ability to use 
uh, OTG USB devices or on-the-go USB devices. Uh, so what we can do is uh, I can take Pluto, I can plug power into the leftmost USB port, uh, and that will just power the device. And then I can plug in a USB dongle, like a Ethernet device, Wi-Fi dongle. Um, we can run scripts from uh, USB devices as well. Um, if they have this special name, Run Me, on them, Pluto will just run them uh, automatically. And this is great for uh, doing captures standalone. You don't need a PC uh, connected to it. Um, there's actually a little button. Uh, there's actually a little button uh, on the bottom case, uh, which you need like a, a pin. Okay, there we go. Um, so the, the button can actually be used from, uh, by the user for different things. Um, if you want to uh, you know, uh, run an action, based on that button press, uh, you can do that. <coughs> a lot of people will connect to like a USB uh, mass storage stick uh, and then walk around and push the button and do captures uh, uh, based on some uh, you know, localized information that they're looking for. Now, uh, so obviously, you can connect it to a, a Linux machine, Mac machine, Windows, Raspberry Pi, uh, across the board, uh, pull data back and forth, configure the transceiver. Um, you can plug. Uh, thumbsticks into it. It's one of my favorite uh, thumbstick images. Very accurate, what it is. Uh, you can also plug Ethernet dongles into the into uh, Pluto, uh, and they'll take the IP address that's in the configuration file on board. If you want to put it on top of like a mast or uh, like on your network somewhere, um, you can access it over that uh, Ethernet context, uh, and you know instead of having it connected to uh, directly to your machine, which a lot of people do. Uh, we also support uh, Wi-Fi dongles. Um, most major dongles that are supported in the kernel, uh, we, we pull in and we can use. Uh, we have a list of known working ones that we've tried, uh, which I wouldn't say is super extensive, but it's uh, what we have around the lab and what's uh, most commonly used by our engineers. Uh, one little experiment that we've done is actually hook up uh, a pair of USB speakers. This actually required a change to the kernel that's on board just to enable this functionality. Um, if you want to do this on your own, we do provide all the instructions needed to build the kernel, to modify the kernel, um, to build the firmware images if you want to do that on your own, to change the HDL if you want to do that on your own. Um, it's a completely open platform. is really designed to kind of uh, allow people to tinker and change things uh, depending on their use cases. Um, but from ADI's perspective, Pluto uh, is really not that different than uh, like our traditional eval boards. 99% of the HDL that's on this device is the same that's on the SOM device, which goes for $1,000. It's the same HDL that runs on our ultra-scale platforms. So <coughs> once you kind of learn what you're doing on this device, learn the software layers, then it's pretty trivial to move to uh, these other higher-end devices, more higher channel count devices which might be uh, a little bit friendlier on your, uh, on your budget. Uh, so you start with Pluto, learn what you're doing, and then kind of move on once you're ready and you need the FPGA resources or you need a more higher-end transceiver or high-speed converter, something like that. There's no standard DES interface for the DSD, uh, ABC, and the Zinc. Uh, n so you, like, you would have to build your own board to, yeah, to yeah. get that, yeah. OK, uh, are there any questions so far? All right. Haven't lost anybody yet? Yes, so I'll, I'll post this on the same web page that you grabbed the, the slides from, or from the, from the labs from, um, a PDF for the presentation. Yes? Uh, so there's a little hole, like it's, it's on the bottom. Yeah, so it's right there. It's a little pinhole. Yeah, yes? Uh, so you can connect to the device remotely. Uh, if you want to, uh, if you connect the Wi-Fi module, um, you can enter that IP address into, say, the GNU radio block, and you can stream data directly from it. Yeah, uh, I wouldn't totally recommend doing that. Um, the latency will be bad. The data rate will be very inconsistent because uh, we can saturate USB 2 like easily. USB 3. Uh, 
Yes, so the, um, the 20 megahertz limitation comes from the front end analog filter that's on the transceiver. Uh, there are no uh, external filters on the board itself besides the ballon, um, which if you're building a product, you need filters out front. Um, uh, later on, uh, if there's time, we can kind of talk about some reasons why you might want to do that. Um, there's some pretty strong harmonics that come out of the device, just yeah. comes out of the architecture of how the transceiver is built. Um, but if you're building a product around the transceivers, you need analog filters. Uh, if you have a radio from, say, like Edis Research, you'll see a big filter bank sitting on the front of the radios. Um, yeah, so uh, w one of the reasons we don't provide them is, like, they're expensive because you need a filter that's over 70 meg to 6 gig um, for our transceivers. So it's, it would be big or really expensive. Uh, so the, like it depends on like Wi-Fi, you're, you're super dependent on the network that you're in. Um, Ethernet, we found sometimes can be better than USB, yeah. than serial, just because the network stack is more optimized than serial interfaces are. Yes. Yeah. Uh, right, yeah. It's, yeah, so you're, you're always going to be limited by USB 2. And, you know, and no matter if, like, you had, you know, 802.11 AC a dongle hooked up. So. But sometimes I found that the mm -hmm. packets, mm -hmm. they break. Oh, yeah. Yeah, because, uh, so IO isn't really designed uh, for um, a uh, contention-based network. It's more like you're directly connected uh, and you're pulling data up high speed. So. On that, uh, yes. 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 So um, <laughs> we work very closely with MathWorks, um, just because uh, a lot of our users use Math MATLAB, use Simulink uh, to do a lot of their development. Um, and uh, so personally, uh, like I used uh, a lot of GNU Radio during my PhD. Um, I'm the maintainer of GRIO. I, uh, if you're familiar with GRDOA, which is the DOA open source uh, or out of tree module, uh, I'm one of the co-authors of that. Um, so I did a lot of like phase array things in my PhD using GNU Radio, um, but depending on what you want to do, uh, uh, you know, like honestly, everyone starts in MATLAB to build their algorithm, and then they move it into GNU Radio. It's just that's that's how it works. Um, and we work closely with the MathWorks because uh, we provide interfaces into MATLAB and to Simulink because that's what our customers ask for, and we build tools in in MATLAB and Simulink because. Uh, that's what, uh, uh, it's the more ideal uh, tool for those things. If you're doing analysis, um, it's, it's kind of like the, the default tool for a lot of that stuff. But, um, and uh, you'll see the MathWorks logo in some of our slides just because uh, we do a lot of presentations with MathWorks. Um, uh, we do a lot of trainings with MathWorks. Uh, they, like we have targeting support if you want to do HDL code generation from those tools. We have automated ways to do that. Um, yeah, just to kind of uh, mention that. Uh, are there any other questions? Yes. About the fact uh, to have a wider coverage, uh, what kind of problem is this? And yes, so uh, the, the, uh, the hack that we have online uh, to extend the range. Uh, we get a lot of questions about that. So the, the difference between the 9363 and the 9361 is the uh, RF bandwidth, so that front end filter, uh, as well as there are some other features of the transceiver that we don't give you access to, like multi-chip synchronization is not included in 63, uh, as well as I don't think LO, external LO support is provided in as well. Um, so what, uh, uh, during test, we don't uh, guarantee that the part works over that entire range that the 61 is validated over. So, so if you don't get the data sheet performance, at those lower frequencies or higher frequencies, then yeah, that's just unfortunate for you. But the chip's not guaranteed to work over that range. So that's, uh, that's kind of the extent of that. Um, internally, uh, we tell the driver that it's a 9364, and then it just moves over that range. So it's just, it, the chip might fall over at those lower ranges. Okay, 
Um, so let's move on and talk about the software stack that we use to uh, interface with these devices. Um, now, uh, so we use this, uh, this software layer called the industrial I.O. layer. And I'll kind of talk about how it's structured and how we use it. Uh, this is not an ADI thing. This is uh, an infrastructure piece that's within the kernel itself. Uh, we use it. Our competitors use it. Um, and a lot of people across the industry use it for, for different things. Uh, now, uh, again, th this, is, this diagram will kind of show up a lot through the presentation. Uh, it's the simplified uh, 9361 transceiver diagram. Um, but you can see that there's a lot going on. And this device has over 1,000 registers that make it work. And we really say that's uh, 999 ways to get it wrong. So there's a lot of HDL and software that make the device work. Now, um, I'm going to be kind of building up how we talk to Pluto and how we talk to the transceiver um, in this diagram. This is a more system level diagram where in the middle we have the zinc. On the left we have the transceiver itself. And on the right we have a host PC that's running GNU Radio. It could be running MATLAB or Python or um, some of the I.O. tools that we provide as well. But I just want to give you a high level uh, perspective on how things are working. Um, but on the far left, this doesn't have to be a, a transceiver. This could be high-speed high converters that we support, as well as even like uh, sensor devices uh, like IMUs or um, amplifiers or, OK, there we go. All right. Um, but uh, I just want, from, from this kind of section, I just want you to get this perspective on uh, this common, uh, common interface that we use to talk to our devices. And this allows you to kind of move across different transceivers, different converters, uh, different sensors. Um, uh, and you can use them all through uh, GNU Radio, so through the uh, GRIO auto tree module. So if you have a device uh, like ADI has, uh, we support over 800 different devices through IO, uh, as well as some of our uh, competitors. And you can use those blocks uh, or those devices with our blocks. Now, uh, the subsystem that we use in the kernel is called uh, the Industrial Input Output Framework, or IAO. Um, and this is really designed for uh, ADCs, DACs, sensors, accelerometers, gyroscopes, uh, kind of low-level pieces that don't really fit into, uh, say, like the input framework that's in the kernel, which we typically use for like mice, keyboard, uh, th those type devices. Um, IO has this very um, hierarchical uh, structure, where at the top we have a context. Uh, a context will be a board like Pluto, or it will be a um, like an eval kit with an FMC card attached to it, and that will have a number of drivers or physical hardware pieces that are associated with it. Um, and a context can be um, local or it can be remote. So a, a Pluto is actually a remote context when you're accessing it from your, your, uh, your local machine. Um, and then, uh, so just below that context will be a collection of devices. And these are uh, uh, like essentially just drivers that are associated with uh, an ADC or DAC. Um, the transceivers themselves will have three drivers associated with them, one for the uh, transit path, one for the receive path, and one for the uh, main control plane. That will be common, uh, common attributes between uh, transmit and receive, like sample rate is a, is a common attribute that's shared. Um, the devices will have these, these attributes, which will contain things like LO, sample rate, filter settings, automatic gain control settings, all the knobs that you want to get at. And then at the bottom, we have our I.O. buffers and channels. And this is how we're moving data back and forth, how we're pushing data to the transceiver, pulling it back. And these will have attributes associated with them. So they'll tell you, like, here's the data type. Um, if, is it signed? How is it shifted in the buffer? Um, all the things that you need um, to kind of understand what the data format is and to move it back and forth. Um, from the perspective of the driver itself, if you want to access the I.O. driver, uh, you can do that by going to sysbus I.O. and then the device on the physical board. So you have to be physically on the device or SSH'd into the device that, your, uh, that, the, that hardware is connected to. And we can do things like uh, look at the name of the device as well as echo and cat into the file descriptors that are part of the sysfs for the driver itself. Um, so the attributes will show up as, as uh, files uh, in, in a set of folders. 
and that allows us to interact with different settings of different devices. And here we're just uh, changing a gain setting of, uh, the, uh, of the amplifier. Um, and we can cat out different settings so we can know what the, set, the current setting of the device is. Uh, a unique thing about I.O. is that it tries to keep things in a human readable format or standard units. Uh, typically, if you look at a data sheet uh, or a user manual for a device, uh, you have to kind of take the register and then figure out what that actually means in real units. And I.O. tries to abstract this to common units like dB or uh, watts, amps, these types of things. So it's a lot easier on the, the user to use things. Now, this driver, as I mentioned, is uh, living in the kernel on the device that uh, that hardware is connected to. So this is in the kernel uh, of Pluto itself. And this is controlling the transceiver and moving data back and forth. Um, but using uh, these attributes is a little non-ideal, because you have to SSH onto the board, cat echo all the settings that you want to change, which is uh, great for a driver, uh, maintainer, developer. But for a user, it's kind of painful. Um, and the, just to give you an idea, for 9361, there are over 200 attributes that are associated with the device. So you have a lot more than just LO bandwidth and, uh, and gain. There's a lot more settings that you have access to. The AGC alone has over 52 settings. So lots and lots of configurability. But they're provided through, um, through IO if you want to get to that low level access of the device. Yes. What kind of loop band would be uh, achievable if you do automatic gain control using a bash script? Or is this. Uh, so, uh, like the. So, it's. It's it, not the recommended way, I think. Or right. So, <laughs> if, if you have very tight tolerances on timing, yeah. you need to do things on the FPGA. Yeah, okay, right. Yeah. Okay. Um, now, to kind of help this, uh, this problem of interacting with the SysFS, we developed something called LibIO or the libio, which is a user space library that simplifies the interface to using these attributes in dealing with these buffers. Um, libio is a uh, C-based library, and, and we have bindings for um, C, C++, uh, C Sharp, um, MATLAB. Um, there are third-party uh, bindings that include uh, like Node.js if you're a Java developer uh, and you want to kind of uh, get like add Pluto support or Libio support into your web application, you can totally do that. Um, and we obviously have uh, MATLAB support um, for connecting to devices as well. And they all have this kind of common infrastructure where, or common API where you create contexts, which is a device, and they'll have a set of physical or drivers that are associated with physical devices. And this allows you to s simplify the interaction with IO and to provide error checking and um, all the kind of the niceties of a, of a library to interact with a device. But we're still uh, running on the device. This, uh, this libio library is running on Pluto itself and is just interacting with the low level uh, SysFS uh, or IO drivers. To help with this, we uh, added this feature called remote backends inside libio, and this allows you to remotely access uh, these, um, these attributes and these buffers uh, from a host machine. And this could be done over USB, over uh, you know, a serial interface, PCIe, um, Ethernet. Um, and it works in this way where on the, uh, on the right um, here, we have a, uh, a host uh, or a, uh, a device like Pluto, which has a IO device associated with it, like uh, the transit path or the receive path, uh, which is inside the kernel. And then uh, we have libio that's running on the board itself. Part of libio is a little daemon called iod, and that uh, will uh, like allow you access to these uh, this driver remotely. And then we'll have a uh, an Ethernet connection, a serial connection, a PCIe connection for for high speed. And then on the host machine, we have the same libio library that's running. And this is what GNU Radio is using. This is what MATLAB is using to talk to the radio itself and to translate commands back and forth. Um, you can think of it as a RPC, a remote procedure call, if you've used those in the past, uh, with uh, buffer capability. And can be used locally or remotely. What's really great about how IO is written, or libio is written, is that uh, you can write code on your host machine, define a remote context, say IP this number, 
write that code, make sure it works, and then copy it over to the device itself, change the context to local instead of that IP-based one, and run the same code. And it's a really kind of nice development style. And you don't have to reinvent that code if you want to move it to the embedded platform. Um, but as I mentioned, uh, this is really the kind of the low-level pieces that GNU Radio is using to interact with a device. So if you, um, if you take our generic blocks uh, that are in GNU Radio, uh, they, you can use them to add additional settings that might not be in our Pluto blocks. So if you want to change like some bizarre uh, setting that's in the, the AGC that no one would want to change, but you want to do it, you can do that through our more generic interfaces in GNU Radio. And it's a, a very kind of extensible way to get at the driver. And that fills out our picture um, fully now. here. So just to kind of repeat the, the data flow. Um, so when we get data from the transceiver, it goes through the FPGA. Then it comes into the I.O. driver that's in the kernel itself. Um, goes out to LibIO, uh, talks through that daemon that's running on the board. And then that will throw data back over TCP IP, over serial, over PCIe, back into um, our host machine that's uh, running GNU Radio or some other software application that's using LibIO. Okay. Is, that, is that clear? Yeah? Any questions? OK. Um, so this could be a Pluto device, um, one of our system on modules, which have like an integrated transceiver, FPGA, or an eval system. Yeah? Uh, the ILD? Mm -hmm. Uh, so, like, um, you mean like send data back to the host machine? Yeah. Uh, not, no. So you can't like insert stuff into the layer. You would have to modify the driver to essentially do that. It's really not meant for that purpose. Um, but with any good library, there's a set of command line tools that we can use to interface with it directly. Um, for I/O, we provide uh, a number of these. Uh, the first one at the top is I/O info. This is great for just finding a device that's um, connected to your local machine. Um, uh, unfortunately, on the, the Linux VMs, uh, it's not connected through as a USB device. It's only connected as Ethernet. Um, and you can't actually, um, the, by default, uh, Ethernet devices are not what we call discoverable. So scanning d uh, does not apply to Ethernet devices. If you know the IP address, uh, you can simply just provide the uh, dash N flag and then the IP, and it will uh, look up that device for you. But if you're on a, a host machine and you have Pluto uh, connected through to that OS, I can open a terminal or a command prompt. And I can just type IO info s and it will find Pluto for me. Yes, so the, the, the that's choosing the, the right attributes or yes yeah so the uh, so the driver will have um, so the, the driver just represents like different settings of the device as attributes to you so like automatic gain control uh, will have say three modes one is manual, one is slow attack, one is fast attack. If you provide it like, um, you know, uh, like hyper attack or something like that, it will error. But the device won't fall apart. So it's, it's tr it helps you uh, not um, configure the device in, a, in an incorrect way. And you don't have to go down to the registers. And you don't have to understand how they work. Yeah. Yes, uh, you mentioned before that it's possible via uh, USB on the go. Yes. For example, USB audio device being attached to the middle port when you power it from the other side. Yep. Uh, but that means there are isochronous endpoints on the USB controller. Mm -hmm. Would it be possible to use isochronous uh, as communication for the RF data between uh, Windows application or V-Radio and the Pluto SDR? Because then you could probably have more latency because you can use a little USB. You don't have all the caching and uh, TCP IP uh, overhead. Uh, yeah, so if you use it as a serial device, mm -hmm. not TCP IP, that's what it will do. Oh, yeah, all right, serial device. And, uh, yeah. okay. 
still using Go Camp for most of the iPhone. Yeah, so I think the, the RNDIS driver does that for you in a kind of uh, optimized way. Okay. Yeah, yeah. so the serial to network uh, like emulation um, uh, is, is designed for tethering. Okay. So uh, if you had like a Windows phone or an Android phone. Yeah, I get a TCP or a serial. Right, so, and people are usually concerned about performance with that, so um, RNDIS is, is pretty good. Okay. Um, but if you kind of want to uh, go a little bit beyond just command line tools, we do have an open source application called IOScope. And this is designed for uh, debugging, visualization. Um, uh, is a lot of people use it for evaluation purposes of the, of the transceiver. Uh, it will expose um, all of the settings for you. Um, and there's hundreds of them available. Uh, the, the application includes uh, time domain, uh, frequency domain plots, uh, constellation plots, a lot of markers, a lot of measurement tools that you can use. Um, and it's completely open source, uh, so you can modify it, add plugins if you want. Um, for each device that, uh, that, uh, that we build, like the transceivers um, or high-speed converters, we have specialized plugins that present uh, their attributes in a kind of useful way. But if you want to modify it for your application, say you have a custom driver that uh, is I.O. based, um, you can use that in this tool. Um, a, a great example is on my Linux laptop, uh, the uh, gyroscope driver that is used to uh, rotate the screen, if you rotate the laptop, shows up as an I.O. device. And if you open I.O. scope, you can actually pull out the gyroscope data from that device, which is uh, pretty unique. Okay. Uh, the, oh, it's uh, completely graphical. Yeah, so this, this tool is graphical. Um, now, I'm just going to go into uh, using some of the IO tools just to give you an idea what it's like to use them and IO scope. Uh, and then the lab that we'll be uh, doing will start off with the low level command line tools, interface with the, the radio, and then uh, go into using IO scope and, and pushing data back and forth. And then the second lab will uh, show how we can kind of translate that into GNU radio. Okay, so uh, back to um, the command line here. I have Pluto connected. Uh, is that text big enough? Can everyone read that? Do you, do you want me, I can increase it? Make it bigger? No, it's good? Okay. Uh, so um, as we can see here, uh, IO info is great for um, scanning for new devices. Uh, if we have, say, an Ethernet-based device, uh, like Pluto is only represented as an Ethernet-based device on, uh, uh, on the VMs that you're using. Um, to see if it's attached, what you can do is type IO info dash N and then the IP address. Uh, by default, it uh, creates an Ethernet device um, um, under the, so the local Ethernet device it will create will be uh, 2.10, but the IP of Pluto itself will be uh, 2.1, okay? And then it will go out and actually pull a bunch of attributes and tell you all the attributes that are available on the device. And as you can see, there's like a lot. It just keeps scrolling and scrolling and scrolling. Okay. Now we'll clear that. Um, and the other really useful tool is IO attribute. And here I'm just going to use the dash A flag. The dash A flag will connect to the first context that it finds. If you're on a Linux machine, a lot of the times you'll have I.O. devices on your machine. So the dash A flag is not always uh, going to pick up the radio. It's going to pick up the gyroscope or a backlight keyboard or whatever I.O. device that you'll have. So um, if you're using dash A, just be aware that that can happen. <coughs> and since I'm on a Windows machine, uh, there's no Linux kernel, so there's no I.O. devices, and I can use that. And then I'll use the, the dash D flag, and that will list the drivers or the I.O. devices that are available on that, as part of that context. Do dash D. And we can see that there's five devices that are associated with Pluto itself. So the ADM 1177 is actually just a, a power monitoring chip, and we can pull out instantaneous current and voltage from that. Um, the 9361 dash phi 
So this is the main control plane driver for the 61. Um, the same driver is used on 61, 63, and 64. Uh, and this, this will contain the shared attributes between transmit and receive, so like sample rate. So, so we'll, uh, uh, <laughs> don't try to comp like copy all the commands. I just want to give you a sense of what it's like, and uh, in the lab, we'll kind of go into these things, okay? Um, yeah. Uh, so uh, the third device, uh, X80C, that's actually the ADC that's on the FPGA itself. So if you, uh, I believe almost all of Zinc uh, FPGAs will have an X80C on board. There's an IO driver for that. Uh, the bottom two, the uh, CF AD9361 DDS core LPC, great name, uh, is the transmit core. And the reason it has DDS in the name is because there are DDSs that you can use in the FPGA. And these are available um, through IO scope, through all the attributes. Um, technically, you can use them also through um, GNU Radio as well. Uh, LPC is in the name uh, because the, uh, the FMC card that's associated with the 61 is a low pin count connector. Uh, when you move up to our higher end transceivers, they'll, they'll, call it, they'll have the extension HPC, and that just means high pin count. The, the bottom driver is for the receive path. And it's just, uh, that will contain the receive buffers for the, uh, for the receiver. Okay. Now what we can do is we can um, list the, so that was the dash D flag. We'll use the dash C flag to list the uh, channel attributes of a channel. And I'll type in one of those drivers uh, that we saw on the previous screen. So the channels that we have available to the, the main um, control plane uh, have uh, our voltage zero, voltage two, voltage three, um, and these alt voltages, which are actually for the LOs themselves. And then if we simply add that to the command, so I want to look at the, uh, the channel voltage zero. Here's where um, the additional attributes will show up. So we have things like the quadrature tracking enable is done here, the RF bandwidth, the, the DC tracking. Um, sampling rate is changed to these attributes. So you can use IO attribute to individually change settings. You can you know, create a bash script around using this tool to uh, set up a device in a, in a um, programmatic way. Um, and it's really useful for just poking at little things or changing uh, one-off settings or scripting things. Yeah? Uh, all, the, uh, all the attributes are the same on type of code, like the building, uh, MATLAB, or C? Y yes. Yeah, so if you, um, uh, so the API that exists in those tools might be slightly different, but as long as um, like you have access to the bindings, then you can edit any of these attributes. Now, so these are the standard attributes. What we can do is also look at what we call the debug attributes, and those are the uh, more complicated ones, or um, like there'd be dragons here, I wouldn't play with them. Uh, they're, they're more advanced settings that uh, most people don't really have to get into. And you can access those by just using the, uh, the uppercase D flag, and that will list the, the uh, debug attributes. And there's a lot of these. They just keep going and going and going. So, but you really shouldn't have to get into these unless you're really tuning the radio for a certain configuration that you need. Okay, so command line tools are great and all, but if uh, we want to get some real work done, we might go into a GUI application to visualize some signals. And um, for that, uh, we can use um, IEO scope. Um, okay, so. Now, IEO sco scope supports uh, Windows, Mac, Linux. So if you, uh, we have binaries, if you have a Windows machine you want to run it on. Uh, the first window that will show up when you launch IEO scope will be this connection window here. And that will allow you to connect to different contexts. We run IOScope on like the Z board, the ZC706, the ZC102. Uh, this is in the Windows yeah, this is a, so it's a Windows, it's a Linux application, it's also a, uh, a Mac application. Um, I'll show you how to launch it on Linux um, to, uh, once uh, when we begin the lab. Um, now what I'm going to do here is just uh, select the um, 
the remote device, the network context here, type in the IP address of Pluto. I hit refresh, and it populates those IO devices that we saw before with that IO attribute command. Okay. Um, I can also select USB devices, and you'll see the same IO attributes. I'll hit OK, and it will bring up a capture window. Uh, we'll go back to that, and a control panel. And this control panel is used for um, configuring the transceiver, um, setting up different modes. Uh, there are two main panels that are associated with 61, 63, 64 base devices. Uh, and they come under this FMCOMS 234 and FMCOMS 2345 advanced tab. Uh, on the newer releases of IOScope, this will say AD936X, so it's not as confusing. But the reason. Uh, that name exists in, in my version of IOScope uh, is because FMCOMS was the first generation of 61 eval boards that we provided to people. So that's why uh, all the tabs are in a lot of our original documentation will all say FMCOMS. They won't say 9361 just because it was the first generation and uh, th it's just they, the names have stuck, in ar stuck around for a while. Okay. Um, now the advanced tab, we really won't get into that just because it's... Uh, <laughs> Kind of, uh, yeah, sure. Yeah. Can we, uh, shut the door possibly? Or maybe not? <laughs> it's a little hot. <laughs> okay. Uh, so I'm just going to go into the, uh, the main, uh, panel here, the, uh, FMCOMS 234. And this will contain settings for, um, the both transmit and receiver. <coughs> On the top panel, we have the global settings. And this contains things that are shared across transmit and receive. We'll have the enable state machine. You can change it from FDD to TDE modes to pin control modes. Uh, the calibration modes. This is primarily for the, um, for the transmit calibrations, but there are some uh, receiver calibrations that you can control. Um, and then we have uh, some of the filters that you can load up into the device. Following that, uh, going down a little bit, we have the receive chain. And here we can select the RF bandwidth, we can select the sample rates, the LOs of the receiver, uh, and we can disable or enable some of the trackings. And then below that is the transmitter where we can set that LO independently as well. Um, the sample rate, if we change it for the transmitter, will change for the receiver. They have to be matched. It's just how the, uh, the part works. And then at the bottom, we have our FPGA settings. And this is where the DDSs show up. And this is where you can tr control them and load up waveforms and generate signals from the boards. What we, what's a DDS? Uh, uh, DDS? What is it? Uh, oh. uh, which one? So. On the right, on the top. Uh, is it further up? Yes. So, uh, baseband. Oh, oh, baseband. Yeah, so baseband DC correction. <coughs> and this Uh, so it disables the tracking. Yeah. So it's, it's, uh, pardon? It, the tracking is disabled. So the baseband corrections, they're tracking on the receiver. Um, they show up essentially as filters. Uh, they're not filters, but they appear that way. Um, but you can simply turn the trackings off. You can't, like, disable the, the, uh, the, essentially the tones that they generate inside. The, the diagram that I showed before, so this diagram of the 61 that's inside the tool itself, uh, this is the simplified version of the 61. There are like eight uh, DACs and five ADCs inside the part that we don't show. And those are used for the tracking and for the calibrations of the part. Okay, now um, I'm going to go back to the capture window here and select uh, voltage zero and voltage one. Actually, I'm going to change this to a frequency domain plot first uh, and then select voltage zero, voltage one. This is just I and Q of the first channel. And I'll hit play and I'm just pulling back data. This is uh, really useful for just like simple visualization, bringing it into the lab, making sure the part's working. And then I'll uh, match the LOs together so I can see what I'm transmitting. 
And you can see the, the LO from the transmitter. And then uh, I'll simply turn, enable a tone and add some amplitude to that. And you can see that on the right. right. So this is really useful for just like debugging, um, checking um, some performance of the device. Um, and there are really useful features inside the plots. So you can enable peak markers and pull out uh, some, some uh, basic information from the tool. So are there, are there any questions on IO scope? So the uh, so the FMCOMS is just a, an FMC card with a 9361 on it. Yeah. Um, so. For so the um, system generator reference design. Yes. Can we use the same uh, values for weight for the FMCOMS? Yeah. So the the code generation HDL tools that we provide, um, you can use co system generator. You can use HDL coder for them, uh, or you can hand code Verilog. You can do the same for Pluto as well. Uh, I wouldn't like do a ton of FPGA development uh, on Pluto, just because they're very limited resources. But you can do uh, a, a lot of things on it. OK. Now, we're going to move on to the lab next. And the lab will um, go into starting with IO tools uh, and IO scope. Uh, please start with the first PDF called um, Intro to I.O. and I.O. Scope that you've downloaded from that uh, website. Uh, if people need me to bring the, um, the link back up, I can do that on the first slide. <laughs> if you do have questions, um, uh, please uh, let us know. Mahai, um, Adrian, and I will be uh, around. Just raise your hand, uh, and uh, we'll help you out. Um, now, the, when you need to, uh, so I.O. Scope has been installed. I.O. Tools have been installed in the VMs. If you need to launch IO scope, just type OSC in the uh, in the terminal, uh, and that will launch it. Yeah. And the PDF that you'll be going through is um, is intro to libio and IO scope. Uh, please only do that one, and then uh, in the second half. Uh, We'll go into uh, the, the second lab, which is using um, GNU Radio. OK, uh, we're going to move on to the next section. Uh, if you have questions after, uh, please come by and talk to me. Uh, if, you, uh, if you have uh, more questions about the labs or the device. Uh, but we're going to move on and just talk a little bit about uh, GRIO and uh, some of the components inside of it and uh, what some of the knobs actually mean. Um, but uh, just before we do that, um, so for those who got to the constellation that uh, you saw in, in the lab, uh, which might have been like four points or eight points or nine points or some weird combination of that, uh, does, anyone know, does anyone know why that happens? Uh, DC offsets? <laughs> so it's simpler than that. Okay. <laughs> so you know, we're transmitting on the same frequency, and we have a cable. So you expect the signal to be perfect that you're getting back, right? Well, the cable has delay. And the cable will unlikely be a fraction, or a, a sample, or an integer delay. So we're basically sampling it, the data at the wrong position. And this is why you need a tool like a new radio to do synchronization signal processing. The transceivers are essentially DACs, ADCs, and mixers. There's no uh, timing correction, no frequency correction, all these things that are necessary for a real receiver. Um, now, just to kind of like just go over where these things come from, uh, which are not just unique to Pluto and some things that are, are unique to the device itself. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, you have that random delay that you're getting, which means that you're essentially sampling uh, at the wrong position in time. And this just comes from going out into the analog domain, just through that cable over the air. Um, now, it, you might have also seen that the constellation itself is rotated. And that actually comes from the fact that there are two PLLs that are used inside uh, the transceiver for the mixers. So there's one that drives into the transmitter and one for the receiver. And these have a random phase relationship. They're frequency locked, 
but they have a random phase relationship. So that means. It's not possible to synchronize the phase comparators of both DLLs? No. Okay. Not internally. No. So you could use um, the external LOs mm -hmm. to help with that, but they have, there's a divider that's not shown in this diagram, and that will cause a w random 180 phase shift. Mm -hmm. And that is different every time you reboot the part. Um, now, uh, if we look at like a I diagram, which is a say an, a very oversampled version of the signal that we're we're seeing. Uh, in this case, this is QPSK, where we're looking at just the I channel here, and QPSK we're transmitting ones and minus ones on the I and the Q channels, and the the signal will transition between one and minus one, or not. And depending on how we sample, that will change the signal that we see. So. If the signal is sampled at a, say, idealish place, then you get a recoverable constellation that looks like this. We see our nice four points of QPSK. But as you shift off that constellation or off that, that position to less ideal places, you get these smearing of symbols because you're essentially getting combinations of, of symbols. And as you shift worse and worse and worse, you get things that are non-decodable. And this is why we need receivers. This is why we need uh, receive algorithms that fix this timing offset. Now, if you add frequency offset, what that will do is actually cause, so this is the constellation many of you have seen in the lab, like eight points. It's ra it'll be random for everyone. Um, but if you add frequency offset, you'll actually see it rotate. This is a really kind of interesting way to see what's going on in your signal and your receiver. So if you're debugging your your receiver and you see it rotating, you know you have frequency offset. If you see these smearing of symbols, that means you have timing offset. And we have ways to correct for this. OK. Um, so I know we're a little short on time, so I'm just going to skip ahead a little bit to the, um, uh, to the GRIO pieces. Uh, so for those who don't know, uh, the support for interfacing with Pluto or other I.O. devices, um, other transceivers, uh, is done through an out-of-tree module called GRIO. Uh, and this provides access to essentially any I.O. device that you want to use uh, and allows you to feed data directly into GNU Radio or out of GNU Radio. Um, you can uh, uh, install it for Windows. Uh, there's a Mac build. There's uh, Windows, actually lin uh, a Windows build that we have a full executable if you want to install it on your Windows machine. That includes all the libraries and all of the um, uh, all the blocks that you need to to use it on, on your on your host machine. Uh, this requires libio, obviously, but it also requires a dependency called lib ad9361, and this is just kind of a specialized library that we use for blocks like Pluto uh, and the fmcoms boards that give you additional functionality on the filters and, and some of the, the clock settings. Uh, inside GRIO, you'll see a number of blocks. Um, we have specific ones that are for the SDRs, FMCOMs, Pluto, uh, as well as uh, more generic blocks. So we have attribute blocks, which are for interfacing directly with attributes. Um, these work on like tags, on, on messages, uh, as well as we have some additional math blocks. Uh, Adrian uh, showed these off yesterday with Scopy. So these are used inside of Scopy to do some uh, math operations. And when you install GRIO, you'll find these. You're like, what are these? What do they have to do with radios? And it's re really just uh, blocks that uh, we use for uh, other projects and for, are really useful for some general signal processing. Now, um, just to kind of open up the blocks for Pluto a little bit and to describe uh, how they're used. Um, so the first line is the, or excuse me, the second line down the block ID is the context. So that string that we were using in the lab, that uh, IP uh, 192.168.2.1, is the URI. This is the, the address that we use for the device. Um, if, you, uh, if, you're, if you have the Pluto connected to your operating system, um, like I do on my machine, you could plug in the USB name, which would be USB colon, and then the actual ID from libUSB. This would be usually three digits long. Um, then we have LO frequency, which is kind of obvious, sample rate, RF bandwidth. RF bandwidth is the bandwidth of the front end filter that's on Pluto, and that's on all the 61, 63, 64 devices. Um, 
And then below that is the buffer size, which is the buffer that libio creates, pulls data back and forth. We have this option called cyclic. What cyclic will do is, uh, on the transmit side, is it will take the first buffer that's passed to it. So if you have a, um, like a, a, a signal source block, you know, like a sine wave generator, and connect that to uh, Pluto, or the, the, the IAO block for Pluto, it will take the first buffer that you're given, pass that to the FPGA, and constantly repeat. And then it will not accept any more samples. Okay. But this is super useful if you don't want to worry about like contention on USB and guaranteeing that you're not um, starving the transmitter. Yeah, it's super useful for debugging. Uh, it's yes, yes. Uh, correct. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So you want to. Uh, so generally, you'll oversample a little bit. So you'll set up the bandwidth, the RF bandwidth, to be a little bit smaller than, um, or your sample rate to be a little bit smaller than your RF bandwidth. Um, uh, attenuation sets the attenuator uh, on the Pluto. Um, will provide at most uh, like 7 dBm, 2 dBm, uh, depending on the, the configuration and the, the frequency that you're operating at. Uh, filter is actually to provide filter files to the transceiver, which are useful for configuring the uh, 128 type filters that are inside Pluto. Um, if you select this auto true, it actually loads up some predefined filters that we use. And if you want to use Pluto below 2 megahertz, you have to load a filter. So if you set this auto filter to false and don't fill a uh, filter, you can't actually set sample rates below uh, 2.084 megahertz. Um, the driver will just uh, error on you. And the receiver is uh, just the kind of the opposite. Um, is the same parameters, um, uh, except you get the additional options for tracking. So you can enable quadrature tracking, RF tracking, <coughs> and select the gain modes as well. And then it shares the filters. Uh, one thing to note is that, um, so the filter, if you will contain, the filter files contain configuration for both transmit and receive. So if you load one up on here, it will overwrite this guy. It depends on what block is instantiated first. Um, and the auto filters do the same. So they load up transmit and receive. And it will actually also change the RF bandwidth, because that's part of the filter itself. Um, now, just uh, talk about a little bit these stream blocks, which are the, gen uh, the generic blocks that are part of GRIO. And you can use these with Pluto or FM comms boards or other IO based devices if you want to, just to pull get access to those buffers and send buffers. And they have a similar interface, except you directly fill in the, uh, the device name, which when we are doing IO attribute dash D, we are getting driver names, and you simply fill them in here. So we have uh, F uh, FC or CF. AD9361 LPC, fill that in there, and the phi, and then you can fill in the actual parameters. So we can set this RF bandwidth in this case. And you can build up your blocks this way, or change the parameters if you want to extend them for, to handle other use cases. Uh, a newer set of blocks are the IO attribute blocks. And these are designed uh, to access different attributes directly. Um, if you want to, say, change the LO on the fly, a good way to do that is through these IO attribute blocks. And they have messaging interfaces, because this operation doesn't really make sense as a stream. Uh, it's a very asynchronous operation. Um, so if you want to set uh, like any attribute of any device um, that's I.O. based, you can do it through these blocks. Uh, and the source is uh, kind of just the opposite of the sync blocks for I.O. attributes. You could read out, for example, the um, here I'm reading out the high threshold value of the AGC. You can read out the RSSI attribute that's in Pluto, uh, which is a relative measurement. It's not a dBm number, just a lot of people ask. Um, but it's, it's commonly used for RSSI pulling out that information and pulling out different IO attributes. So um, just to give you uh, some perspective on how the blocks are built, um, everything is um, inherited from a IO device source block or sync block. Um, in the case of the 61 based devices, uh, that goes to an FM comms source or sync, and then Pluto actually inherits from that and just reduces the number of channels that you're using to, to two. Yep. So if I want to use a, a very low sample rate 
So uh, if you want to use Pluto at a low sample rate, um, you have to load up the uh, filter to get the uh, extra decimation. That will bring you down to 530 kilohertz. If you want to go below that, there is a filter that's available in the FPGA that you can use. And that will bring, that gives you an additional decimate by eight. So that will bring you down to uh, 65 kilohertz. Um, and there's a special attribute you need to, to set. Yep, it's yeah, it's in Pluto today. Yeah, so if you uh, uh, if you look at the driver, the CF eighty nine three six one LPC, the receiver driver, and you list the attributes there, you'll see one that says sample rates, and it will give you two options: one that's normal, and then one one that's decimated by eight. And you just set it to the decimate by eight, and you'll get the lower rate. So uh, it's um, like since it's in the FPGA. It's a little bit separate than the standard driver, so you need to kind of uh, add this uh, additional piece to get access to it. Uh, yeah, it's just a yeah. I, I believe it's a CIC filter. Yeah. So the face is flat, right, or the face? Yes. Yeah, so I believe it's like 80 dB down. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, now, uh, so the next lab we're going to go into that will uh, go into using GRIO that will show you how to go from the command line and then add attributes into a uh, IO device. So we'll build up a essentially a, a Pluto block um, using the stream devices. And the device specific blocks, they're just this, they're built this way. We just kind of predefine the attributes for you. Um, and the what I really want you to get up out of this is uh, so in the Pluto blocks, we provide kind of standard attributes for you to set. But there are over 200 you can set on the transceiver. And so Pluto, we don't want to scare people off with all these settings. And that's why we kind of limit the ones that you can set uh, in the block itself. But if you want to extend the blocks, a great way, an easy way to do that is with the, the generic sync, sync and source blocks. And the lab will show you how to actually create one for Pluto. Okay, so the, the lab is just a second PDF. Uh, 